Good morning. We said that, but it's still a good morning. It's a little bit different this morning. It was kind of dark when I, when I woke up. So, good morning. You know the song we just sang, whew, Who is Worthy, None Beside Me. This is the summary of where we are in Ezekiel. Dry bones, living again, singing as one, hallelujah. God Almighty, great I am. Who is worthy, none beside thee. These are the themes of Ezekiel. First of all, the idea, the great I am. This is it. This is the whole point of the, of the whole book, that God is the Almighty. And the second point is that He's made us alive. Dry bones, living again. And what are those dry bones doing? That's what we're going to talk about today. They're singing as one. One voice. Just one voice. So, uh, because dry bones can live again. And we talked about that last week. Man, thank you, Jeremy, again uh, for the sermon from last week. Uh, but we find out that dry bones can live again. What was dead can come back to life. And, and that could be a, a lot of things. Your passion, your relationships, your life in God. What was dead can come back to life. There's hope, right? We have hope. And, and so we, what we find in Ezekiel 37 is not only that resurrection life is possible, and we should find out about it, but we also find out what it looks like. And what it looks like in Ezekiel 37 is reconciliation and peace and, and unity. And this has to do with individuals as well as people groups. Some of you in the room there may have been a moment where you were together with someone and then you, you weren't. I mean, this could have happened at breakfast this morning with Kimberly and Kevin. I don't know. But there's been a day in their life probably where they were grumpy at each other. Amen, Kevin? Nope, never mind. <laughs> Sorry there, bro. <laughs> but this happens with people, individuals. There's a falling out. There's a separation, but also in people groups, us and, and them. And this is what's going on in the moment of Ezekiel and the, and the speech about the dry bones. And, and what it was were, what the point was, the nations, two nations, Israel and Judah, were in this ongoing war. Now, remember, these two nations started out as a family, brothers, and then they grew, and the brother's family grew, and they went to, down and were slaves in Egypt, and they came out, and, and they came out, and over the years, the brothers and the nations that came from the brothers became enemies, and, and primarily because of jealousy and greed and pride. These people groups who started out family ended up enemies and there was much hatred and war. As a matter of fact, it went on and on so bad. And, and so if you read through 1 Kings and 2 Kings, uh, there's this dialogue going on between God through prophets to the kings. But in the political scene and in, in the, the military scene, these two nations, surrounded by other nations who got involved at times, were always constantly fighting. It was Rehoboam against Jeroboam. It was Abijah versus Jeroboam. It was Asa versus Basha. It was Jehu versus Joram. It was all these guys, Ahaz versus Pickett. Here's what, there's a summary. And this phrase happens several times in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It says, this is about Abijah and Jeroboam. There was war between Abijah and Jeroboam throughout Abijah's life. 1 Kings 15 verse 6. These guys... We're brothers, and then the brothers, the families grew, and then they became enemies. The north, the northern kingdom, 
This was 10 tribes worth, was often called Israel. Sometimes it was called Ephraim. And sometimes it was called Samaria. It was called Samaria because the capital was Samaria. Different than the Samaritans. That's a different group of people. The south was almost always called Judah or sometimes Jerusalem. But these were always pit against each other. And so here we come to this great story about dry bones. And that what was dead can live. And there's hope for all of us in our lives too. And so what's the application that Ezekiel takes it? That God says through Ezekiel, what he wants to do is, and it's this. He wants these nations to come back together. So what he says is to Ezekiel, take a stick of wood and write on it belonging to Judah, or as this stick of wood says, and the other translations say, for Judah. He has a stick of wood. See my stick of wood? That's to my dad who will watch later. (laughs) Stick of wood. And take another stick of wood, it says, and write on it, belonging to Joseph, or for Joseph. Here we go. Two sticks. And so we have two sticks, two nations. And he says, then he says this, like, you know, you do to your children who you're playing tricks on. Join them together into one stick in your hand. And so this is what he does. He, he puts these sticks in his hand and he says, and they'll be one, they'll become one in your hand. One nation. Oops. One nation in their hand. And and this little demonstration was for them to hear this word that what he wants out of them isn't for their own sake, their own private sake, they're going to become the dead bones are going to breathe again. It's not for their own sake. It's not just for their little family, not for the ones who they care about, but it's for the whole nation all the nation, and then maybe even all the world. So you're thinking about the stick that's become one, but not only is this the message of Ezekiel. Going even further, Jesus prayed for complete unity. And what I'm going to call that is know thems. Now we've been in the book of Ezekiel. Now this is our ninth week. If you'll turn your page over, You'll see eight weeks worth, that's eight weeks worth of sermons. We've been in Ezekiel. And some of you are saying, how long? How long? (laughs) Just a little longer. Well, we're going to talk about the two sticks today, but then we're going to go off kind of on a little tangent next couple of weeks. But it's going to include this idea that there are no thems, because what Complete unity eliminates the categories of us versus them, right? If you have complete unity, wait a minute, complete unity, this is the prayer. This is the prayer we, we make famous every Sunday. My prayer is not for them alone, right? I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, just, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. God is after complete unity. Know us, know them. Know thems. Again, we'll talk about that more in a while. But this idea of more thems, or excuse me, know thems, and the idea of complete unity is for individuals, but, it, but it's also for groups of people. And it's not just for, you know, Keverly, Keverly, Kevin and Kimberly, when they have had an argument over where they're going to go eat lunch today. <laughs> but it's for people groups as well. It's for this group, this nation of Israel and this nation of Judah who for Decades, centuries had been at war. It's for all of them as well. That's who we're talking about. And so the steps to unity are first reconciliation, 
then peace, and then we're headed to complete unity. Before unity is going to come reconciliation. Before I'm going to be one with you, I've got to tear down what's between us. This is what Jesus, Paul talked, said that Jesus did in Ephesians 2. He said, for he himself is our peace. This is Paul talking to the Ephesian church. He himself, God, that Jesus himself is our peace. He made the two one. Now, he's talking in this case, Gentiles and Jews. But later in the book of Hebrews, he talks about other people groups. He talks about slaves and masters. He talks about men and women. He talks about children and parents. Any people groups who are set against each other, He's saying these people groups need to come together and because Jesus himself has torn down the wall, the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus has torn it down. Again, in the next few weeks, we're going to take a little jaunt off into this topic. But for today, I want to consider an idea. And that idea has to do with categories of division. Categories of division. Uh, Also could be called the dividing wall. What's the dividing wall? So this is what happens, human beings. Uh, We're individuals, unique, created by God. Just each one of you, a unique individual, right? Right? And so to describe yourself, you have this unique identity. Joe is unique, made by God, different than anyone else, different than those who are maybe closest to him, like his daughter. They may share some DNA, right? But they're not the same. They're different. Sometimes a lot different. I don't know. I don't know. Now they're, now they're having a little family thing going on here. <laughs> Might have hit on something. Not sure. As human beings, here's think, think about this, this idea of categories. As human beings, we describe ourselves and others by our differences, right? It's, it's differentiation. We have differentiation, which means I am me because I'm not you, okay? This is, we're explaining I'm an individual. I'm unique, created by God, different than you. And I, in my difference from you, that's how I describe myself. For instance, tall, some people are tall, some people are short. And if you're going to describe yourself, would you describe yourself as the tall man or the short man? Well, for me, if I was going to tell someone to come meet me, they didn't know me, and I was going to say, I'm going to be standing outside with art. I'll be the tall guy. That's what I would say. You know, I'm telling you who to, this is me. But, but also, some other ways I would describe myself, you know, I'm funny. Proof that you laugh at my stuff. I'm smart. Sometimes I'm productive. Sometimes I'm nice. All these things, though, are compared to what? Right? You're funny compared to Who? So we're doing a lot of comparing all the time when we're, when we're doing this. One, one thing, you know, I'm, you talk about how you look. And so, for instance, I might say I am the bald guy. But I might say I'm not the bald guy. <laughs> now I would say I'm the guy who lost a bet. right? We're different. Uh, Right over there. We're different, and we describe ourselves by our differences. We do that with people groups as well. For instance, there was the cool kids in your school and the nerds. I don't know where you were. I called myself a cool nerd. There's Aggies and Longhorns. Uh... There's people, where are you from? You, you, we differentiate by where we're from. I'm from Texas. Art's from Chicago. Uh, there, we can tell differences but by our accent. 
When you go to the Northeast, people think you're talking weird. When someone from the Northeast comes to Texas, we say, we say they're talking weird, you know. But we, we're different. Uh, and sometimes this is by our language. I speak English. My dad says he speaks two languages. He speaks English and profanity. I said, no, <laughs> you don't even speak English, brother. You speak a Tex- Texas version of English because I've heard you talk. You know, he doesn't really speak English. Well, these categories describe, but they can also divide, right? Categories, they describe us, they differentiate, but they also can set us against each other. And, and this happens. This is how enemies are formed. A lot of it is because we have this competition with each other. Who's the funniest? Well, that's not that big a deal. But sometimes we do categorize each other, and it's us against them. I am, you know, I'm not an Aggie or a Longhorn, but if it, you know, if there's the Red Sox fans in the room, you know, I'm a Yankees fan, and we're in competition. We compete. And in this competition, sometimes we believe that the they, whoever they is, are going to take something from me, and I don't want to give it. Maybe it's the trophy. But maybe it's more important than that, like it's my job, or it's my money, or it's the affirmation I get from being the funny guy. Now, I'm not the funny guy anymore because someone else is funnier than me. So there's this growing sense of competition, which again, in these these guys who started out brothers and ended up fighting, it was jealousy, it was greed, it was pride. And the next thing you know, there's a family squabble that turns into nations fighting against each other. And, and God says, I don't want that. I want us all. I want to have one nation. And this is what Ezekiel 37 says. Put those two sticks together. And I want my people who've been fighting, some of them All of their lives they've fought. For generations they've fought. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to be against you just because you're not on my side. Because of your accent, I don't like you. Because of the place where you were born, I don't like you. I'm suspicious of you because of your skin color. And on on your sheet, you have these things. And there's a hundred of them. We could put a hundred of these up there. I... I'm rich, you're poor. I'm white, you're not. I'm an American, you're not. I'm male, you're female. All these different categories. And I want to say they're categories that divide. And what God is doing is trying, coming to say, no more categories of division. He's not just saying, let's pretend that we're friends He said, let's eliminate the categories. We're going to talk more about that in the next couple of weeks, especially the idea, how can I, from the New Testament, I know some of you think we're stuck in the Old Testament. We kind of are. But the idea, how do you love your enemy? We'll come to that. We'll We'll come to that. But today we're thinking about this idea of reconciliation and unity, and the two sticks becoming one. So I want to tell a story. So I coached football for nine years at ACU. And uh, at the end of that nine years, I was 31 years old. Uh, I ended up coaching again a decade later. But uh, nine years, and the head coach that I was coaching for got relieved of his duties. This happens to coaches, you might know, and other people too, but coaches, it's a regular kind of thing. And so when a head coach gets relieved of his duties, the assistant coaches are in kind of limbo. And so we had a new head coach come in, even though for about mm, a good solid three and a half weeks, it seemed like I was going to be that next head coach. But it turned out I wasn't. So another man comes in, and he takes a couple of weeks to evaluate the staff. That's an awkward couple of weeks. Am I going to still have this job or not? Turns out, not. Didn't. And so my two sons and I were walking 
uh, they're walking across, we're walking across the practice field on the way to the weight room, and, and they are uh, five and six years old at the time, five and six years old. And so the new head coach is walking, and we're going to pass him, and I'm walking with them, one on each side, and as we walk past the man, I introduce the boys, and I tell them who they are, who, you know, make the introductions. And then as we walk away, my youngest son uh, says to me, Dad, is that the guy who took your job? I said, well, yeah, he's the new head coach, you know. And, and honestly, think, of, think about the scenario. It's not his fault, right? He didn't make the decision not to choose me. Someone else made that choice. He just came and took the job. And so there's no, there was really, seriously, no animosity between me and him. But as we walked, my son, he's five, he says, and kind of with grit in his voice as a five-year-old could have it, I'm going to boo him. (laughs) I'm going to boo him. And all of a sudden, an enemy was born. You see that? And from then on, in his eyes, even though I tried to work this out with a five-year-old, boy, that dude was fiercely loyal to his dad. And I tried to say, this isn't, no, you don't need to feel. But it's like, he's my enemy because he hurt my dad. Right? And so we, we get enemies in all kinds of ways. Sometimes we don't even know who the person is, and we're an enemy. Somehow, we've become an enemy because of where they're born, because of the job they have, because of the accent they have. Whatever it is, they're they're my enemy, and they have to be my enemy because that's just the way life is. And God says, no, I want These two nations who have been enemies for generations to be one, to just to be one, complete unity. So how do we get there from here is the question. Or maybe I would say it more this way. What's your next step? Uh, Because, man, sometimes reconciliation is difficult, right? If you ever had an enemy... And, and or, 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 let's say a friendship that turned bad. And uh, I, I know some of us are in the situation where we were in not only a friendship that went bad, but a marriage that turned out not good. Uh, sometimes we have, even now, people are doing things that are hurtful to people we love. People we know. How do we deal with that? And I, I'm with Kevin as well. Kevin preached a sermon for those of you who are listening on the, you know, uh, Facebook, Kevin preached a sermon earlier today, and it was good, uh, about judging, and yet still there's a, some accountability for people who are doing harmful and bad things, and we're going to get to that too uh, in a week or so. But right now the question is, how can I take this step towards reconciliation so that God can take my step towards reconciliation and bring these people to complete unity. Jesus is praying for something that's ridiculously impossible, and yet he prays for it, right? And so we pray for it every week. One of the most impressive, and yet, really, we pray for that every week? Unity? So... We're taking this step forward, and the step is reconciliation. What can I do? What can I do? Well, here's what I'm saying. As we go towards reconciliation and then peace and between people and then maybe complete unity, let's surrender the things that place people into categories that create the wall of hostility. Okay, so what I'm saying is, that often we're placing people into categories that make them our enemy. What if there was no category of us and them? 
There's no thems. There's no such thing as a them. Not a they in the sense that they're hurting me. They're my enemy. They're one I have to stand against. So I want to suggest that pride is one. Pride is something I need to lay down and let go of. All Red Sox fans are not going to hell. Most, but not all. You know, why do I have this such a... You know, and honestly, have you ever gotten angry in this anger you carry with you over a sporting event? I have. It's dumb, right? It's just dumb. That darn Tom Brady, I can't stand that guy, you know. <laughs> and, and sometimes the, the things we get angry about are more important than that. But a lot of times it comes down to these things, pride and, and a grudge that I, that I, that I still, I'm, I'm maintaining that grudge. Do you ever, have you ever had something that you had to maintain for it to, you know, you had to feed it almost. You have to feed this grudge. But something happened a while back, a long time ago, and I was hurt, or someone I love was hurt. And even though a lot of life has gone by, I still, I have that grudge. And what else? The other, and, and other things. What is something you think you should mm, surrender, let it go? Maybe it's fear. It's fear that those people, the them, they're out to get me. They're going to be the ruin of me. Well, we're going to think about that. Next week, we're going to spend some time specifically, uh, uniquely in our unity prayer talking about why we do the unity prayer. And we talk about it almost every week, why we do it, a little bit. We're going to go a little deeper next week into the unity prayer. What what are we doing there? We're going to go a little deeper into the idea of communion and the idea that when we come to the table, who, in your own personal head right now, who would you feel uncomfortable being at the table? I, I kind of, there's some people who would probably walk through that door and say, I'm not sure I want them to come to the table. So we're going to spend some time at the table and talking about <laughs> who gets to come to the table. The idea of complete unity. In the meantime, I want you to think about this. What, what do I need to surrender? What attitude? What, what memory of the past I need to surrender and let go of. Today we're going to sing uh, an old song. Uh, We're going to sing the greatest command. And uh, I want you to claim the message of this song. Just claim the message. You know, you, you might sing your part. I'm going to, when, when I, uh, when I sang it this morning in practice, I'm singing the bass line. The bass line of the song is from 1 Corinthians 13 about what love does. And when I sing that song and I think about situations of my own personal life right now, I want to claim the truth of that song. And wherever you are in your life, I want you to claim the truth that God has made us alive. He's breathed into our dry bones for the sake of reconciliation, that that we can be one, that that we can be one people, one nation, one church, one family, that we can be together. And I want you to hear that song we're going to sing, speak into that message, that two sticks he made into one. I have uh, 
and maybe some of you do too, my dad's in the Army. And we have Army in our roots. My family is a family of soldiers going way back. And one of the things that we have is the diary, some of the writings, and then also medallion from one of our relatives who was a soldier in the Civil War. And in some ways, it seems like, is that war over? Is that war over? Or is this some kind of grudge maybe that we're maintaining? Or is there something more that needs to happen? But I know God's intent, God's intent is for to be one, all of us, everyone, one in his church. And regardless of where you come from. And so maybe there's some things we need to just surrender, let go. Have I been hurt? Do I still have scars? Yes. Do those scars have to define the relationship I have with the person who gave me the scars? No. Because there was other scars that define that relationship, and they were on the cross. Jesus died to redeem all the broken relationships that I have with people groups, with individuals. So I want to surrender. Let this go. Let it go. Two sticks become one. Let's stand up and let's sing this song. And let's claim the message of this song as we sing it.